Runners only with Dom Harvey. Runners only with Dom Harvey and Ryan Fox, New Zealand's best golfer. G'day, mate. Hey, mate. Well, you, you can say that Lydia Coe's a little better than me at the moment, to be fair. Female. She, female, yeah. You say yeah. male golfer. Okay, male golfer. We got that. We got that. Hey, welcome. Thanks for coming over. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, first things first, I guess we have to tick off. Um, oh, actually, no, first thing, um, this podcast was set up by Eric Murray, who's been on the podcast. I saw he was playing a charity thing with you last week, um, so I flicked him a message saying, oh, hit Ryan up, see if we'll go on my podcast. And then next thing you know, he, he sent me your number, and here you are now. I, I just want to know, what is Eric Murray's sales pitch? What, 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 is, what does he say? How does this happen? Um, was it a hard it sell? No, it wasn't a hard sell. He's like, hey, Dom wants to get in touch with you. Is it all right if I pass on your number? And Eric's done plenty of stuff for me. And that, you know, I host a couple of charity events. Pretty much if you have, if you host a golf day in New Zealand, you could get Eric there, basically. I mean, <laughs> well, he, he loves he, it more he's, than you. He's obsessed. <laughs> and yeah, so, you know, he's done, done me plenty of favors in that regard and playing my couple of my golf days here and there. So, yeah, it's not hard to repay the favour a little bit in that right. regard. Oh, amazing. Well, I, I appreciate you being here. Um, now, the podcast is called Runners Only because I'm, I'm passionate about running. I love running. And I know that everyone's got some relationship to running. So what's yours? You're forced <laughs> to do the cross country at school? Yep, that's that's about yeah. the extent of it. I've had um, I've had ankle issues through golf for years. Um, I've got flat feet and bowed legs, which is unfortunately <laughs> genetics. Um, and I always hated running at school, but after... You know, sort of hurting my ankle early on in my golf career, I've stayed away from any of the impact stuff. So, um, so you got no relationship to running n- at all. None. You know, maybe running between the wickets and cricket back at school was the last time I probably <laughs> ran ran anything properly, and it's been a long time since I've been at school. Right. Well, I've seen you. I've seen you playing golf as most of us have, and uh, you're a big hitter. So I'm guessing it was much the same with cricket. You did what you could to avoid the cheeky single. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Fours and sixes were much easier than uh, than the quick singles. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, well, you, I mean, you don't need running in your life. Like, you've got a fantastic other side hustle going on, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Golf goes all right so, at the moment, yeah. to be fair. And, I mean, I still walk 10K a day on a golf course. You know, right. that, that's pretty much what it is. So, it's not running. You look at some, I mean, this, there is speed golf now. Yeah, a mate of mine had the world record for a while, and with your drive, you're a very long hitter. You, if, if you could just get a bit of speed in those ankles, mm. you'd be okay. Well, we've got the world champ at the moment, don't we, Jamie Reed? Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. and he he's trying to break a hundred, which is shoot under seventy and under thirty minutes, which seems absurd. Yeah, to be honest. bonkers, bonkers. But I'm, I full respect to that. I couldn't shoot. I couldn't do that trying to run one golf hole, let alone the whole course. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's. There's always, there is a little bit of a relationship between golf and running, yeah. just just not with me. Yeah. Now, let's um, talk about some of your stats. So, end of 2021, you're 213th in the world. Uh, end of 2022, 29th in the world, uh, I, I, which is just, it's bonkers to me. It's amazing. It's such a substantial jump. But I want to know, like, what's the difference between those two numbers? Is it just like a, a couple of lucky putts, or are you just a, a way different and way better golfer now than what you were 12 months ago? Um. I don't think I'm a way better golfer per se. Um, it's it, you get a lot out of the, out of good results. So, like winning makes a massive difference in the world rankings. That's where you know it's all the world ranking points yeah, are front yeah. loaded. And I had a lot of you know top finishes, including a couple of wins this year. So that helps massively with the world rankings. But I think overall, if you look at say scoring average, which is what you know, anything's kind of based on. Yeah. It's only about half a shot difference around. Like, it's not, when you think about that over the scheme of things, it's not, it's not, it's not a lot. Yeah. But yeah. It, obviously, you know, the the lower that is, the the harder it is, you know, to improve. To improve. So, yeah, those incremental gains. Yeah, and, and obviously it's a, a bit golf course dependent too, right? You go, yeah. a harder golf course is obviously harder to shoot a low score on, so your scoring average suffers if you play tougher golf courses. Yeah, for sure. So um, goals for 2023. Um, so you've climbed 174 places in the past year. If you go up just 28 places this year, you're going to be the best in the world. Uh, you, like, uh, is it as easy as that or no? No, so I, I think if you look at... It's, it's based on a points breakdown, um, and my average points is somewhere close enough to three per event. Where what does that mean? It's so so, what, so the world ranking you get given a, a set amount of points okay. per event that you play in 
and, and it's all based on the field strength. It's quite a complicated equation. But basically, you earn points at the end of a week depending on how you've done. Obviously, the, the better you do, the more points you earn. Yeah. And then you, they basically take a divisor of how many tournaments you play, and it's a minimum of 40 and a maximum of 52. Right. So you've got a... And it's a two-year two year rolling ranking. So my... My points average for the last two years is somewhere around three, probably just under. And you look at, um, I think Rory at number one is somewhere around nine. Oh, okay. so I wow. was I was sitting, you know, probably at two hundred in the world. I was sitting at somewhere around one, you know, just under mm. one one point per averaging one point per event, and I've taken that up to three. Then obviously the jump up to go to world number one is pretty pretty significant. And if you go back. You know, a long time ago when Tiger was dominating um, world golf, he was averaging 20. Jesus! So at one stage, he was more points ahead of second than what second have had average, if that makes sense. It's nuts because he's still... I mean, everyone knows Tiger Woods, and even now if he lines up... Um, there's always a story on the sports news here in New Zealand about how he's, how he's going and how his back is and yep. whatever. Um, but he, what was his win percentage? Like 20%, 15%? So at his peak... It was something around 30, 33, yeah. which, you know, if you compare it to other sports... Like the All Blacks or, or Chicago or, Bulls. Or, or, or like even, even yeah. you know, tennis is probably a nice direct comparison, right? Because it's an individual, individual sport. You know, Djokovic and Dale Federer, those guys are up in the high 80s, yeah. early 90s, something like that, over a whole career. But you're only trying to beat one person at a time. Yeah. Where you're trying to beat... You start the week, 100. there's 155 other guys in the field you're trying to beat. So... It's yeah, like it's it's a little bit different in that respect. So th- when you when you think about it, thirty three percent doesn't sound like a lot, but then when you compare it to pretty much everyone else, especially in the modern era of golf, it is absolutely absurd. Mm. When you can a Hall of Fame golf career is sort of eight or nine PGA <laughs> Tour events and two and yeah, two majors, yeah. and Tiger's got fifteen majors and. 80 something PJ Tour events like it's it's absurd what yeah. he did and and it was over but he still lost a lot yeah he did and he finished second a lot there's lots of other top 10s um but he also had lots of wins uh, lots of seasons where he won nine yeah. times i mean that's unheard of yeah it's bonkers so he's um is he still behind jack nicholas the golden beer in terms of majors yeah so One i don't behind? think i don't think he is three behind jack three jack, behind jack, jack okay. was 18 and I don't think anyone's going to get close to Jack's number. I think, yeah. you know, golf is, you know, it's become a bit harder as a sport, both on your body. I think, you know, there's a, a lot more power involved now and that, you know, the career, the longevity isn't in a career anymore. Just look at Tiger. You know, Jack won his last Masters at 46. Mm. And Tiger's been broken since he was before he was 40 you know he's had a he's obviously won a masters and a couple other events since then but yeah. it's nowhere near the same level um and also i think because there's so much money involved in the game now there's much more comp you know it, it's a much more viable career path as an athlete yeah right so there's more more people doing it so i don't think you'll see anyone beat jack i don't think you'll see anyone get near the tiger to be yeah. honest yes yeah, so speaking of the money it was exactly happy anniversary it was exactly a month ago today that you finished second at a tournament in South Africa and won one point one million. Yeah, which is from like from where I'm sitting. For me, and I suppose anyone listening to this podcast, the only way you'd get a payday that big would be if you won a lot, or maybe got an inheritance, or sold a house that you'd had for many, 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 many years. So, my celebration with one point one million it would probably involve um, maybe some strippers. <laughs> Cocaine, <laughs> a helicopter somewhere. <laughs> uh, I don't know what. What was? What do you do? What do you do? You, uh, you, you finish second. Um, you win one point one million. What, what does that night look like? Um, to be honest, I went to bed relatively early and jumped on a flight the next day with a two year old on the way to Dubai. <laughs> so um, I did. I did actually go to the bar at business class on the A three eighty and have a couple of drinks while my little one was technically trying to sleep in my seat. I didn't complain too much when I got sent back to the bar. But, I mean, it's – we've got a very funny way of life in that regard. Like, you know, you've got – Where is in your family or golfers? Well, no, just, just golfers oh, in right, general. Right. I mean, our, our family's got a weird way of life as well. But um, we make – because everything's in bunches, right? Like, generally – and this probably wasn't the case this year, but generally you make 80% of, it, 80% of your money in a year – and 20% of your tournaments. Right. So it's 
Well, just in terms of results. Yeah, so, okay. and, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, in professional sport in general, you're never at the top of your game every week. And you get found out a bit more in individual sports, mm. potentially, but, you know, there's only 20% of, you, of the time you're actually really on form. The rest of it, you're going okay, and then there's a bit at the bottom where you're really struggling. And, you know, you make a lot of money real quick in golf, but... I think what a lot of people don't realise is, you know, unlike sporting teams and stuff like that, where everything's kind of covered, it's not for us. We pu- we cover everything. Yeah, I wanted to want to ask you about that. So you, you win you win one point one million. I'm guessing there's taxes and stuff involved, and plus um, who like who's on who's on Team Fox? You've got a caddy. I, I've got caddy. I've got two coaches, manager. I've got a physio. I've, I've got a physio that on tour. I've got physio trainer back here. I mean, there's. A decent amount of people. So, what are your yearly, regardless of how well you, you do, like at the start of the year, like what are your fees for the year? Um, so, I, I mean, it's hard to work out, but basically, every event you've got flights, accommodation, food for a week, and other sort of random expenses, and then you know you're adding physio on top yeah, of that yeah. and all of that. So, I would say before you, before I kick off for a year, it's a minimum of a quarter of a mil New Zealand, ma- ma- maybe, maybe, maybe more, and then, it, it, then basically, it's the the more you earn, you get you pay out in percentage for caddies and coaches and stuff like that. So, um, you know, if I look, at, just going off the top of my head this year, my expenses per se, because I've had a really good year, are going to be well into seven figures. Mm. Which is fine. It's fine because it's you've already made it and you're paying out from that. But you know, at the start of the year, mm. you are, you know, you probably it, it probably costs you between five and ten grand a week, mm. depending on where you're traveling to. Yeah, that's when when you're in a, a slump. Like, I'm, and I'm thinking um, Michael Campbell for a time, yeah. and also um, I'm from Palmerston North, so I know Grant Waite. Yeah, um, him for a time after he won the, what, the was it the Kemper Challenge? Yep. The, yeah, Kemper Open. Yeah, it's, you've got to be like I'm hemorrhaging money, and I'm yeah, <laughs> I miss I miss seven cuts in a row and. 2019. So if you miss a cut, that means that means you the you first two no, rounds yep. you get axed. You don't make any money. No, and your I mean your expenses are exactly okay. the same. You've still got your caddy fee. You've still got your flights. You've still got your accommodation. You've still got all your food for a week. So that's you know four or five plus grand minimum right. for the week. Ooh. And I kind of I think to an extent it's almost gambling. You know, it's 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 control it's it's, 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 it's it's control gambling, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You go, well, I'm backing, uh, yeah, I'm I'm backing my own ability, but I, you've got to spend money to make money in that sense. So, yeah, yeah, it, it gets. If you'd have told me, you know, in my first couple of years as a pro, where I just travelled around Aussie, the expenses weren't too bad. You know, it was still 40 or 50, 60 grand a year, but yeah, you know, I could I made a little bit and mm. was like, oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've had a good year. All of a sudden, when you're travelling around the world doing it and um, you know, we do a lot of long haul stuff, and I'm lucky enough to be able to do some of that business class and all of that now. But it, it gets steep pretty quickly. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, when it when you're up in there, you know, five, six, seven hundred thousand a year in expenses, it's it's it gets quite scary quite quickly. So is your caddy on like a flat fee each week, and then it gets a percentage. Yeah. So okay, so when you won that one point one million dollars a month ago today. Um, I'm guessing part of you is like, yeah, the points that I get for the world rankings and this and the, yeah, but the caddy must be thinking, oh shit, this is a good payday for me. 10%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, he gets eight, eight of that. So it's like eighty-eight thousand. Yeah, yeah. I paid him forty-five thousand pounds or something. Oh my god! So what did he do that night? Strippers, cocaine? <laughs> no, he was the same as me. I mean, he, I, I think he had a, he had a couple of beers with his mates and that was it. But it's again, it's it's kind of weird. Like it's you get. You actually get numb to really. The they money. just become figures. They just become figures. Like, yeah, okay, it's a lot of money, and you know, I'm certainly not downplaying it at all. But you get so used to so much coming in and so much coming out in chunks. Like, I don't even, I wouldn't know what a weekly paycheck looks like. Mm. You know, and and you go through. Yeah, I've got a cut. I'll have a month or six weeks without getting paid anything at the moment, and that's kind of normal. And you know, when you go all right. You know, you can cover yourself for a while, that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a, as I said, it's probably a very strange way to make a living. It is. It's nuts. It's bonkers. And you caddy, you fly him business class, eh? Well, no. So he covers <laughs> he, he covers his own expenses. So that's how it works. Right. Put, the flat fee kind of covers most of his expenses for the week. So he can choose to fly business yeah. if he wants uh, or not. Um, most of them generally don't. They're just quite <laughs> happy having a couple of beers in the lounge and try to pass out on the plane. Um, you know, and then... 
you know, he he gets a uh, he basically they're essentially gambling on me, right? Yeah. Or gambling yeah. on your player. If you if your players, you don't really make anything out of the fee for the week. You just make sure you don't lose money, mm. and then you know if your player does well, then you you make a good mm. wage. Like you know, my cat has got eight percent of whatever of well eight, eight and tens for a win. So he's he's had a couple of pretty. Yeah. pretty decent paydays this year from me and it's you know it's pretty cool he's yeah I, like this year's changed his life quite significantly oh i bet i bet so when when you're lining up like those final putts and there's 1.1 million dollars on the line um he may be able to play it cool but his his partner back at home or whatever she must be thinking fuck if ryan gets this we can renovate the kitchen or i d- i don't i don't know i just stay you away don't need that I, I stay away from it and to be honest like i don't think about it either i, I know early on I kind of, I kind of did. You kind of think all oh, this putts for ten grand or twenty grand or whatever. I mean, if you start thinking of it that way, you just lose the plot. Yeah. It's it's all about just okay. Well, this is it's it's as weird as it sounds. It's better to have a putt to win a tournament than it is to have a putt for a million bucks. Yeah, but I'm guessing guessing you've got enough. Um, you know, we talk about the expenses and uh, the ingoings and the outgoings. I, I suppose you've got enough of a buffer now or a base that you can just focus on the golf and focus yeah. on the rankings involved. So it's not about the money. It's about no, the... no. And and to be fair, it's not about the money at the start either. But um, when you're first starting out, you know, you you go to Q School, which is a way to get on a tour, and that costs you a bunch of money, and you're almost in a hole to start with. So it, it auto- almost automatically becomes about the money because you need to play well to actually be able to keep doing what you're doing. Right. And then you know, once you at least know you cover yourself, then it's about the results. Yeah. It's not you know, there's definitely guys that play for money out there. I'm not, I'm not one of them. Obviously, it's a, it's a really nice benefit of it, but it's you know, it's like hey, you know the, um, I you know I want to win tournaments. Yeah. I want to do well, and I get more reward out of you know, I won Dunhill Links a you know a couple of months ago, yeah, and I yeah. got much more out of that th- than looking at what the paycheck was at the end of it. Just what, what do you mean, much more out of that? Like getting your name on a trophy? Well, yeah, it just you know that's what it's etching your name into that, history. Yeah, yeah, that's what you know. I, it was a tournament around the old course at St Andrews. It's, it's yeah, the home of golf. Yeah. I got to win the tournament around there, and that means a Fuck, a cool. whole lot more in terms of legacy, in terms of your career than you know whatever that paycheck was. Yeah, and I suppose in a way. Does that mean you're exempt from going back to qualifying school for many, many years? Not or? many, many, but again, the one thing we don't have in golf is job security, right? right. So, yeah. you know, imagine for you on a podcast, right, that you have to have a certain amount of subscribers or a certain amount of listeners every year. If you don't reach that, then it disappears. Shit, I would Which, have been given a, given the ask from the platform ages ago. So, and, and that's kind of what it is for us, right? <laughs> you start out from scratch at the beginning of the year, yeah. and if you don't earn enough money you start, you go back. And, you, you know, I had a mate this year who's been on tour for a, uh, quite a few years and he played terrible, made a couple of cuts and he's right, you know, mm. right back from scratch and burnt a, a lot of money this year. And it does happen. So winning is the one that gives you the exemption. So mm. I've got exemption till the end of 24. So it's kind of nice having, you know, I, I know I've got, job, I've got job security for two years. That, yes. That's a big part of this game, which you don't get otherwise. Oh, how good. So the, the Q school thing and all, all of that, I, I want to get back into that, but I feel like we need to go back to the beginning and unpack the life of Ryan Fox. So so um, when you're born, how far is your dad into his career? Your dad's the great Grant Fox. Who's so I was born in 87. 87. When did, when, did, when did your dad retire? 93. 87, okay. So, so 87 was obviously a pretty important year. For, for all oh, the Rugby fans. World Cup, yeah. the very first Rugby World Cup. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so that's it's actually it. it's actually quite funny. My wife was born on the day of the World Cup final. Actually, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I only found out about that because they did some um, newspaper thing quite a few years ago and rang all the uh, parents of the kids <laughs> that were born. Actually, she was born during the right. during, during the final, and they. Was, ra- they rang all the parents and, well, they rang her mum and she, mum's going, well, you never believe it, but she's actually going out with uh, one of the, you know, one player's of the guys, son. one of the players' sons. So that's how I, that's how she, she didn't know. What an amazing full circle thing. So do you know much about the birth? Like was the, was her dad present? I, I, I was think, there a TV? I think I, the... I'm pretty sure her dad and the doctor were watching a fair bit of TV. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about as far as I got with that. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for you... You must look back and think that was an unusual childhood. I suppose at the, at the time you don't think anything of it because it's just your life. Um, but your dad was like a New Zealand fucking rock star. 
Yeah, he's, I mean, he still I still is think, one of the greatest goal kickers ever. So you must have been, you know, I don't know, sitting on fucking Martin Crowe's lap as a kid. And uh, yeah, I mean, it. yeah, when you you actually hit the nail on the head. When you're a kid, it's just normal, right? That's what I grew up in. It doesn't matter. But yeah, like Martin Crowe was dad's best mate. You know, going into the changing room and being able to call all these All Blacks and you know Auckland players by name. And know them, and you know, still, you know, dad's still friends with them to this day, kind of thing. And obviously, I know, you know, guys like John Kerr and Sean Fitzpatrick, those guys, yeah, you know, it's kind of weird to think about it now that I've got some perspective on it. But as a kid, it was just, okay, that's JK or that's it's Sean. Your, it's your normal. It's just normal. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, I was lucky enough, you know, dad coached all my rugby teams growing up. So we, you know, felt like we kind of had an advantage there. I got coached by Martin Crow for batting and cricket when I was a teenager. I mean, you know, it's pretty hard to have access to that any other way. So, yeah. and got to play golf with, I think my, one of my first memories on the golf course, one of the first rounds of golf I ever played was at Royal Auckland, where Dad was a member, um, which I'm a member at now. And I think I was about 10 years old, and it was Mark Nicholas, Ian Botham, Martin Crow, my old man, and I sort of tagged along and had a few shots. And you how, old were, how old were you at the time? 10. So, so you didn't, didn't realise I didn't that. even know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I knew cricket, and I probably knew who Ian Botham, Mark Nicholas and Marty were, but I didn't have any appreciation. They were just, yeah, yeah. you know... Dad's mate. Do, yeah, dudes that Dad and Marty knew, and that, oh. was, that was it. And you look at it now, and, you know, people pay literally thousands of dollars to play to play to play in that, and, and, yeah. and that four ball kind of yeah, thing and yeah. i'm just some random 10 year old walking around just hacking balls around but it's nice that you can look back at it now and realize what a huge huge thing it was um what was what was your what do you know if your dad was even at your birth because it was a different era back then he, he, now if an all black gets pregnant they, they'll get excused from tour and stuff but back then it was rugby first he was around for mine he wasn't around for my sisters a f- couple of years later i think she was by all accounts she was a little bit late and he delayed going to was it Japan? I actually right. don't, I don't know. I mean, I was I yes. was three years old yeah. or something. But he delayed going somewhere, and then she still wasn't born, and then he disappeared, and she was he met her six weeks later yeah. or whatever it was. And, and what was he? What was he like as a dad growing up? Because I've heard some um, podcasts and radio interviews he's done recently, and he seems like um like yeah he, he seems quite quite gentle and quite kind and quite cause his his view on the current players and what they have to go through in terms of like social media and cancel culture and stuff. He's um he's quite empathetic. Empathetic was he was he always like that or was he quite uh, tough? He was quite tough to be fair. I mean he was always he it always came from the right place. Yeah, he was super competitive. So. I mean, anything, no yeah. I mean, that's that's. I mean, he, he stopped playing tennis before I could beat him. Put it that way. He didn't, what he didn't, age? Oh, I was like thirteen or fourteen. Really? Yeah. I mean, he he cited a bad wrist and he still has a bad wrist, but I think he gave it up a little bit earlier than he probably could have otherwise. Um, really, we started to snatch a few games off him here and there. Yeah, he didn't talk to me when I first beat him off the stick at golf. Is that right? Yeah. How yeah. old? Oh, I was about fifteen then. Dad's played off single figures. He's played off sort of four or five since I can remember. So he was always pretty good. What, what do you mean he didn't speak to you for two days? I oh, was angry at how we played. Right. You know, there was, and, you know, there was, I, I was a city coach, major rugby growing up. I, I didn't help myself. I played first 5'8 and, and kicked goals as well. So I was fucked. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, 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 no, but when you beat him in golf for the first time as a, as a teenager, were you were you like like bragging or gloating in the car ride home? Were you, were you no, like, no, 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 no. That, that, that's that, that. You weren't poking the beer. Oh no, the bear was the bear. The, <laughs> the, the bear was the bear poked. didn't need to be poked. I mean, and that was yeah. You know, dad, dad was dad was great. Always supportive of everything I wanted to do and whatever. It didn't matter what sport, but there was there was a pure hatred of losing. And whether it was snooker, there was you know I, I don't I don't remember <laughs> snooker, I don't, snooker, table tennis, tennis, golf, whatever it was. I don't I don't ever remember dad being. I, it might have happened when I was really young and I don't remember it, but I don't ever remember Dad being nice enough to let me win when I was good enough at something to give him a go. You know, it was always like, well, if you're going to beat me, you've got to beat me properly. I'm not giving you it. Amazing. So so, <laughs> I'm, so I'm fixated on this golf thing. So so, so you get home and it's, it's just everyone's sort of walking around at eggshells for a couple of days? Or Yeah, I mean... I, I, that, <laughs> you're look, exaggerating about two days. I probably probably am. <laughs> That's what I remember, but it was probably more like two hours and he was just... <laughs> you know. Just grumpy. And, I mean, you know, he's... The amount, he's still the same now. I mean, there's... there's he hates playing bad in golf. I think most mm. golfers hate playing bad, but Dad's yeah, Dad loves a 
a few a bit of swearing and I mean I've got a couple of great stories of him on the golf course. He's I played in New Zealand I opened with him as a, and he was my amateur partner. And I, you know, he's he doesn't mind a club throw, doesn't mind swearing on the golf course. <laughs> and I said, Dad, there's going to be quite a lot of people watching us out there. He's like, you, you know, you probably can't, you know, throw throw your toys and throw clubs and swear. And he goes, he goes, I can get away with not throwing a club, but there's no way I'm not fucking swearing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what happened about three holes in. And there was another one. Um, it's a mate of my old man's, and we used to play golf every summer down at the mount at the mount. And I just got a new set of clubs. I was probably like 16, 17, or something like that. And I had a bad shot, and and about four holes in, I chuck I, I, four holes in, I chuck my club, and my old man looks at, at his mate and he goes, "Look, I know this is hypocritical, but I'm going to have to go at him for this." <laughs> <laughs> so he scolded me for throwing his clubs where I've, 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 I've learnt it off dad. <laughs> so yeah, dad was yeah there was yeah. It, it was competitive. I mean, even eating in our household was competitive. You know, I he, he went to boarding school growing up. If you didn't eat fast, you didn't get seconds. So he always ate fast, and I always wanted to eat as fast as he did or faster. That's amazing. So it's just we just grew up in it. Wow, just one of those people that's competitive with it. So you'd think if you were if you were that good at something like he was at goal kicking and playing rugby, that you could let everything else slide in your life. Well, are you no. the, are you the same or are you? Um. I'm, I, I, mean, I would you're... say I'm a bit more relaxed in a lot of ways than he is. Um, I'm a lot less analytical. I think that's that was where him and I differ a lot. You know, he was always, and playing golf, he's the same. He's If something goes wrong, he wants to know what it was. Whereas I've kind of been like, if it's a trend, I'll figure out what's going on. But if it's one bad shot or one bad thing, it's just easy to just go, oh, mm. stuff, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's funny, you know, I, I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago, this one called The High Performance Podcast, and they had Johnny Wilkinson on, same yeah. position as your dad, um, probably almost as brilliant as your dad as well at, at goal kicking. And he, he was the same sort of thing. He said he's finally got to a point in life now where he can do things like um, go to the Christmas show with his kids, put the, the ping pong balls in the clown mouth and not be too upset if he doesn't, if he doesn't win. Yeah, I dad dad hasn't got to that point. I don't th- I don't think he'll ever get to that point. Yeah, you'd hope not. So um, so I mean, it might, I don't know if you even thought about it at the time because maybe maybe when you're a kid, it's not one of those things you even think about. But there must have been a massive amount of pressure, like growing up with the fox name, especially being a rugby player and playing in the same position. Yeah, I mean, I definitely didn't help myself with with. There was always going to be, yeah. If I'd have gone and played flanker or something like that it wouldn't have mattered as much you know oh it's like okay it's fox's kid but yeah when you when you play the same position and kick goals as well yeah there's always going to be that direct comparison and you you know i got i definitely wasn't as good i was okay at rugby in that sense like i wasn't it was no shame in not being as good yeah oh yeah i mean yeah it's pretty hard to live up to that so but was it was it your call to like were you like i want to play that position because i want to be like, like my dad or do you think coaches are like oh I think it was a little Get bit early Fox on. In there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a little bit early on, it was like, okay, well, your dad was good at this. You should know what to do. So you go in there, and it just ended up being, <laughs> being me. And that's about the only thing I had over dad is I was a bit better at tackling. I was a little bit bigger than him, so that's the only thing I had. I, people thought they could run over me, and yeah. I wasn't so bad at making them fall down. But he always said he had Michael Jones inside him, which was a pretty, <laughs> pretty fair answer. He didn't have to wow. tackle with Mike. With well, Michael. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, so, were you good at naturally good at sport growing up? Were you just one of those annoying kids that you're good at, pretty good at rugby, Unf- pretty good? At- unfortunately, yes. I mean, my mum's dad played cricket for New Zealand as well. So, Merv Wallace, he was in, um, played for New Zealand from mid 30s to early 50s. So, obviously, World War Two in between. And yeah, I've read about this. He, he was you, you didn't have too much of a. He was quite old. You, he was he quite was old when pretty, you were born, pretty so. old when I was born. Yeah. I had a fair bit to do. You know, he, he had a fair bit to do with my cricket when I was younger, but he was quite ill, sort of, in my early teenage years, lost his sight and stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, didn't, yeah, I think he passed away when I was sort of 20 or 21, but oh, so okay. he kind of didn't see any of my golf career yeah. to, to an extent. But there was definitely sporting genes there. My mum was decent at tennis, so we grew up playing. Oh, cricket. was she? Yeah, yeah your mum, I mean, Adele. Adele, yeah. yeah. Not, not, uh, not to any international level yeah, or sure. anything like that but she was a good interclub player right. and she played a lot of tennis when we were kids um, and you know we played uh, everything growing yeah, up I mean yeah. rugby and cricket were my two main ones cricket was uh, tennis was probably number three and then you know dad always played golf as well so I kind of I always had golf clubs as a kid and then sort of played joined a club at 13 and started actually playing properly then and got down to a pretty low handicap for at about 15 and that 
you know, it just I was just one of those annoying people that, you know, seen if you ever oh. had a ball, I was relatively right. competent at it. Oh, if it was running, if it, like... if it was running, <laughs> like running, I'm I'm useless. I could yeah, run yeah. for something. I could run after a ball fine in rugby or, or run between the rickets and cricket to an extent, but running for the sake of running didn't get me. Yeah, well, maybe you just found it a bit boring. Or... I, don't, I, I don't know. I just, I don't, I think it was also one of those things I was never good at. Yeah. So it was kind of, you know, as a, you know, some of the ball sports came a little bit easier. So I gr- obviously gravitated towards them a lot more than something I wasn't very good yeah. at. Yeah. So okay, so so you, you so you go through school. Um, you, you're playing you're playing golf. You're playing a bit of tennis. You're playing rugby. You're playing cricket. Um, when when do you drop the other sports? When do you so, reach that sort of like fork in the road? Well, that actually was at university. So I started, um, I started a law degree at Auckland University. I gave up rugby after I left school. I played a year of men's cricket after I left school and didn't enjoy that as much as as playing with my mates at school and. Then I decided that um, I still needed something competitive. I need. I wanted to do something, and I played off a two handicap at that point. So I was like, okay, well, let's give golf a crack and, and see what happens. And got some coaching, played my first tournament, and I th- well, in a June or July of my first year of university, and I absolutely loved it. And that was me done. So I finished. I didn't finish a law degree. I ended up with an arts degree in psychology. And mum and that was the one thing. If mum and dad were going to support my golf, I had to stay at uni, even though I didn't really go to uni very much <laughs> towards the end of it um i passed i got my degree it was all good um but you know sort of i guess when i was 21 20 or 21 when i first made the new zealand squad and that was when i kind of figured that i had a chance with golf is that quite late yeah it's very late, late. Uh, yeah is it yeah i mean yeah. you've got you know we've got there's a couple of twins on tour at the moment the Hoygaard twins on the on the european tour and they They'd won five times between them before 21. Yeah, and Lydia Coe, she was world number one when she was like eight or something. Yeah, something like that. I mean, she. <laughs> went, I think she. I think she won on the on the LPGA at 15. Yeah. As an amateur. Fuck. Well, to be fair, women's golf has always been younger than men's right. golf in that respect. I don't. Was well, that a strength thing or? A... Oh, I, yeah, I think obviously you're a bit more fully developed as a woman. Okay. At sort of 15, 16, right. than what you are as a man. Yeah, you, know, you yeah. it's you don't put on that bulk, you know. So a lot and a lot of guys go to college as well in the states and sort of turn pro at twenty one, twenty two. Yeah. There's still, you know, uh, you know, Rory McIlroy, a few others turn pro a lot earlier than that. But it's it's definitely getting earlier now than yeah. what it was. You know, it's it's it all, golf used to be, especially in the men's game, a relatively old man's game. You know, mid thirties. <laughs> And sport mid thirties is, is relatively old, right? That yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, I was I was thinking about this this morning. Um, like golf and probably distance running, like marathons. Yep. It's one where if you're in your thirties, it's probably your your peak. Yeah, and golf is still. I think I read something the other day. Like the average age on the PJ Tour fifteen or twenty years ago was like thirty seven, thirty six or something, and now it's twenty eight. So, I think just because mm. there's there's more power, everyone's a bit more athletic. I, I think it's going. It's not going to quite go down the road of all the other sports where at sort of 35, it's pretty hard to compete. But it's getting harder now, and you, you, your shelf life isn't quite as long as what it used to be in this game. Yeah, just because of the strains on the body. Yeah. 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 Um, so oh, you mentioned you, um, yeah, you, you started doing a law degree, then you switched over to psychology. Does the, does the, because I feel like golf is such a mental game, does the psychology degree help you at all these days? Or not really. Nah? I mean, the, the biggest thing I had growing up was I had a, I had a sports psychologist anyway, right? And my right. man, you know, it's it's not doesn't use the technical terms or anything like that, but just the advice know, or the, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, of- the idea of routines and the idea of you know dealing how to deal with pressure and stuff like that. While he didn't specifically try to drill it into me at any stage, you know, he caddied for me a lot when I was playing amateur golf. It just kind of it happened. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's true. There are a lot of parallels between the two, aren't there? Especially goal kicking. You know, if you yeah. think the ball doesn't move, you know, it's all you've got to start everything yourself. It's all target oriented. It's all kind of a repetitive movement. So, yeah, there's, there's a fair bit mm. in that. I think top level sport in general, at the highest level, is more mental than anything else. Which is why, you know, you see lots of teams or whatever get people from other sports and to to kind of yeah. offer advice maybe not the technical side of it but the mental side of it is very similar across across the board mm. you speak you know we're talking about Eric Murray earlier you know talk to Eric and the you know about high performance 
And Eric's a Jack the Laddie. You know, he loves a beer. He, he loves, loves having beer. He loves having a bit of fun. But you get him on the high performance stuff, mm. and you can see why he was, you know, as good as he was because yeah. he was he was really driven, and he, they, he had a really good perspective on how high performance worked. Yeah, right. And am, am I um? Did I read somewhere that you your dad put you in touch with Steve Hansen as well, and you did some sessions yep. with him? Yeah, I've been lucky. And again, I mean, it's you know, not many other, not many people probably yeah. had that opportunity. And what what could Steve Hansen, one of the one of the greatest all black coaches ever? But what what sort of advice could he offer you that your dad couldn't? Um, it was just a lot of it was going through how they deal with adversity, and I think you know, were, mom, you, were you going through a patch at the time? I was or? struggling a little bit at right. the time, and it, I think it's it was one of those. Where Steve was really, really good is how we articulated it, right? He was, my old man understood it all, but the message was a little bit blurry to an extent at, at, at for what the All Blacks were doing, whereas obviously Steve Steve had a much more inside grasp of what was going on, but he actually, what made him a great coach from from what I could see from the outside is his man management, how we articulated yeah. it to his players, and I think how we, you know, he made it really simple for me, but I, you got the feeling that, he could sort of tailor the message to kind of fit the person because everyone's obviously different in that regard, right? Sure. But, you yeah. Know, it's it's that's why you've got so many different sports psychologists around and stuff like that because people needed sort of it's all kind of the same stuff, but it's it's how the yeah. how the message is portrayed that you know resonates with with each individual person. Yeah. Well, did, did it give you anything that you could pass on that could be useful to anyone that's listening to this, or is it very very specific? It was, it was to you and golf. It was quite specific, to be fair. Um, I've got it all. I, I could probably find it. I'm, I've got it all written down, and yeah. it was... Um, like, is it something that you read and refer to, like the morning? Yeah, I've, I've, not necessarily, yeah. Um, but I've gone... Like, I've gone back and looked at it. Um, I think the one the one I remember off the top of my head was they had sort of the idea of you were a redhead or a bluehead, and not red. Oh, yeah, blue is cool, blue and is red cool is when and, you're losing, you're cool. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah it was yeah. basically like... You know, when you're under pressure, you've got a, you've pretty much got a choice to be one or the other, right? You're a redhead and you lose your cool and you, you know, everything's kind of emotive and you know happens really quickly. Or you can be a bluehead and, um, you know, be cool, calm, collected, make the right decisions, sure. kind of thing. And, and you you can make it a choice. So that you know that's kind of what I remember specifically. There was a lot of, about enjoyment in it as well and finding ways to enjoy the hard stuff that the you know the going through the hard work even though sometimes it sucks when you're doing it that's where you get the enjoyment yeah, from at the yeah. end you know once once you've gone through it and you get the success all of a sudden the hard work becomes enjoy you know doing that hard work actually has some enjoyment to it yeah wow well, that's good so what do you do to reset like a, if you, if if the red hits, say you've had like a like an absolute shitter of a shot or a hole, is there something you do? Like um, I know some of the All Blacks like looked at a person in the crowd or touch the grass or. Um, is, is there anything in particular you do? Not, not really. Um, Just throw your clubs. Yeah, it's not your fault. Oh, no, you got it's, that off it's your not me. I mean, I'm I'm I'll be one to call myself a few names under my breath. And yeah, I think everyone that's played golf is call themselves several things that you probably don't want to do otherwise um it's good that you do it under your breath i've heard tiger do it out loud God oh, damn I mean, it, tiger. We, yeah well he's done a lot worse than that to be fair i think <laughs> i think we, i think we all have on the on the golf course it, it gets you big yeah. time but um for me it, I mean, it's it's the whole one shot at a time i actually don't for me i don't it doesn't really matter how you react to a shot mm. it's the it's the ability to get over it i mean you know, there's some guys that are really cool, calm and collected. You know, you think of someone like Fred Couples um, that looked like nothing ever bothered him, that he could hit the best shot in the world or the worst shot in the world and the reaction was mm. kind of the same. Or you had Tiger, probably the opposite end of the spectrum where, you know, he was he wore his heart on his sleeve to an extent and he, you knew exactly what he thought about every golf shot. Yeah. So It's funny that, that, that you think Tiger because in the back of my mind I'm thinking John Daly, a guy, yeah, that's, a guy that's capable of having think, 15 in a hole and... I would say daily, daily let it get to him. What I was going to more go down is they, Tiger and Fred reacted very differently. But yeah. what they could do is once they got to a shot, is forget about what had happened, and that's kind of the thing. You just got to go and regardless of what's happened, you know, every your next shot's a new opportunity, kind of thing. Like mm. there's no point reliving what you've just done or getting angry or whatever. So yeah, if you've you can get angry when you hit it, but once you get to the next one it's 
you've got to be able to reset, and that's kind of what you've yeah right what you've got to right. do, and that's kind of just the process going forward. It's just go. It's try to be as simple as possible. Pick a shot, hit a shot, and and trust it. Yeah. So, um, did did you start sort of getting into? I know you got into golf before because of your dad, but did you sort of um, fall in love with it because of the tiger effect, or were you was he sort of before your time a little bit? No, he was he was definitely. Um, was he I was about peak when I you was were? about ten right. when he won the Masters, so that was kind of yeah that impressionable that, age. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Like, so I, you you were getting into golf at the yeah because there was like Tiger, Ernie Els, yeah, Tiger, um, Ernie, Phil Mickelson, Phil, yeah, that was that a golden was, era of golf. Yeah, it's that was a pretty good era. I mean, you look, you almost feel sorry to an extent for guys like Phil and Ernie. I mean, they would, if they were in any other era, they legitimately would have been <laughs> yeah, just potentially the best golfers yeah, yeah. they've ever been. Or in in that conversation, and all of a sudden you've got someone come in and when Tiger was on, he made them look second rate, mm. which is, and they made everyone else look second rate. I mean, it was, you talk to some of the guys that played with Tiger in that era and it was scary how good he was. Mm. Have you, you ever played with him? You, you must I've, have been in the same tournament as him. I've played, I've played a few tournaments with him. I've played behind him a couple of times in tournaments. I've played a, a hole with him in practice, which was quite cool. I mean, it, it was at the time where he was really struggling with a back and I think... You know, he was dosing up on painkillers pretty pretty hard at the mm. time. So I think he was a little bit on a different planet. Sure. But, um, yeah, just to say that I've I've done it was cool. I'd love to play with him in a tournament. I mean, I know it's an absolute yeah, circus, yeah. a complete circus. But yeah. Yeah, In terms of the crowds that yeah, follow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But apparently he was really good at controlling that. Like, he was always, regardless of him wanting to win, he was always really respectful of his opponents and he'd quite often mark really short putts because he knew if he if he tapped in, the crowd would just disappear to the next <laughs> hole and leave whoever poor bastard that was putting with you know this crowd that was yeah. uncontrollable. So he was... Oh, he's had years to think about it, I guess. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's impressive to be under that much scrutiny your whole time and perform the way you did. Yeah, and I think what makes it even more remarkable, like the um, the, the personal life stuff, like when he was when he was when he was banging cocktail waitresses and he was flying girls over to Australia and had all this stuff going on. He was playing phenomenal golf then. It was almost like he was invincible at that point. I think. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I he seemed to him and the the other guy who I spent a lot of time with. It seemed to be that was Shane Warne. No matter what was going on, off, you know, the cricket pitch or the golf course, as soon as they got on their respective grounds. They managed they'd, to block everything turn, They could out. block everything yeah. out and turn it on. And, you know, Warney would play Ashes series, you know, with whatever going on off the back <laughs> and all of a sudden take 40-odd wickets and, you know, hold a hold the Australian team together kind of thing. Like yeah, you, you guys, you guys, um, you weren't close, close, but you were friends, right? Yeah, I knew Warney yeah. pretty well. I played yeah. quite a bit of golf with him. And, well, yeah. sorry for your loss earlier this yeah, year. That, that, that must that be was, one of your low points of um, 2022, I guess. I think it's still a bit of a shock, to yeah. be fair. Um, yeah, so what was your relationship like? You text each other? Yep, you, yep. Yep. Um, I played a, lot, went, played a lot of golf with him in the UK. Um, played the Dunhill Lynx, which is a pro-am tournament with him every year. So, you know, he was... I, I felt like, you know, if I could... I could text him and I knew I'd get a reply. So right. w- what that means is a friendship, I don't know. But, yeah, he was an idol of mine growing up. I used yeah. to bowl a little bit of leg spin. Um, and probably up until about a Sodi, we haven't had we haven't had a leg spinner in New Zealand that I can remember for yeah, a while. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to be able to call him a mate, and yeah, he was he was great fun. Well, I wonder why he gravitated towards you and not one of the Aussie guys. Like Adam I actually Scott don't. Or I don't know. I mean, he he played the Dunhill Links. He'd played a bunch of times, and he played with some Aussies. And I literally got a text from him one year. I think it was twenty sixteen or twenty seventeen. He goes, Foxy, I don't know. Um, if you're keen, but I'd love to pair up with you at Dunhill Links this year. And I'm going, A, why is Warney texting me? And B, why does he want to play with me? But I'm certainly not going to say no. And we got along great. And, I mean, he, like a couple of years ago when my daughter was born, I said, oh, I'm looking forward to, to watching it. She was born just before Christmas. And, um, you know, the Ashes series was on in Aussie at the time. I said, oh, I'm looking forward to, to watching some cricket and hopefully the little one gets some sleeps on me or something on the couch so I can, you know, watch the, watch the cricket. And I sent him a photo one of the days of my daughter sleeping on me with the cricket on in the background. And he's like, oh, perfect, just keep listening. And he gives us a shout-out an hour later on air and, you know, 
my wife and daughter's name and everything like that. And that was just the kind of dude he was. But he, yeah, he was he was fun like that. Like you could, I got him to, you know, I had a couple of drinks with him one night. And I was copping some stick from some mates. And I go, hey, Warney, can you, uh, can we do a video for my mates? He's like, yep, no problem. He goes, he just goes, you guys are fucking ball bags. He pulls the fingers <laughs> at them. And, and yeah, I send that video on straight away. And you're like... <laughs> okay, that's you know he was he was he was awesome fun like that. He loved absolutely loved golf as well, but he was again one of those guys uh, like Eric in a way. Like he was a Jack the Lad, but if you got him talking about high performance or something like that, you could see why he was so good. But he could all he was also just as happy sitting down talking shit and having a couple of beers mm. and just talking about completely random stuff. He's a phenomenal guy. Like you you don't meet actually you need know, to. Apart from his ex-wife, there's probably no one that's got a bad word to say about him. Everyone talks about how he had time for everyone. Yep. Um, you must have had some good nights on the piss. Yeah, I kind of tried to stay away from him a little bit in that respect. I think <laughs> Did you? I, I, he Does wasn't. He, go- he wasn't as bad. He wasn't as bad as what it was made out to be. Like, but when he went, he went hard, Full sand. and it was generally on like vodka Red Bulls or something weird like <laughs> of that. Course like, it was. like. He wasn't. There was, as far as I know, there was never. He hated drugs. Yeah. yeah. Um, he wasn't. He didn't really have too many beers or anything like that. You know, he'd have a, a social beer here and there, but when he wanted to push it hard, he was on. Yeah, so, you know, Jaeger, Jaeger and Red Bulls, Jaeger Bulls. Vodka, vodka oh. Red Bulls, or so, like it was something. And he would just he would wreck himself, and it was mm. pretty. It was pretty funny. I did get on the piss with him a couple of times. It was, mm. he's good value, and some of the stories that would come out would be gold. Yeah, because I, I suppose yeah, that's the thing about your sport. Like you, it's probably one of the few. You not that you would, but it's one of those sports that you could do um, with a hangover. Yeah, I mean, it's not. <laughs> It happens every now and again. I probably don't do it very much, but this is, you know, it's probably one guy a tournament that's got a little. He's played bad one day and turns up the next day with a little bit of a hangover. It certainly used to happen a lot, lot more than it does now. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, it's not. You're still out outside for five hours in the sunshine. Like yeah, it's not. Yeah. You you still get whacked pretty hard if you're hungover, but you know it's not like trying to run a marathon or or, or play a yeah, rugby play a game, game or rugby. something something like that. So oh yeah, so, so back to warning. So we're. I just remember being in complete shock when I you know, picked, up, picked up my phone one morning and he was dead in Bali. Um, do you remember that moment? Where were you? What were you yeah, doing? Yeah, I was hosting a charity event in Waihe Beach. It was a fishing and golf thing and I'd woken up early to um, to go fishing that morning and I turn on, I think I checked Twitter to start with and literally the first thing that showed up was Warney saying, condolences to Rod Marsh who'd passed away literally yeah. the day earlier yeah. and then I'd got a couple of random texts during the night and I was so, I was so sorry to hear about Warney so sorry to hear about Warney I'm like what? because I, I, all I've seen is that tweet and obviously go go through I think I tried to find on social media or the news or whatever and found out that he died in Bali and it was like well this was, was surreal. it was surreal I mean yeah to, and you know I didn't go to the funeral or anything like that it, I couldn't quite get over for mm. it but to you know, to watch it and hear all the tributes and, you know, I kind of felt I'd had a similar experience to a lot of people with Warney. Like, you know, you said earlier that he had so much time for people and that's what I kind of felt like. Like he'd, you know, if I ever did well on anything, he'd send me a message. You know, if I ever sent him a message for anything, cricket, I just send him a few messages regarding cricket every now and again and there'd be a back and forth there. He'd always have time to reply. Yeah, and, and, and with his funeral, it's like, Shit, he's got a relationship with Ed Sheeran. He's got a relationship with Elton John. It's like, how does he? He, he, do he, he was, if you if you go on famous people, he was easily, other than maybe Tiger, potentially the most famous Tiger and Michael Jordan potentially the you know one of the most famous mm. sports people going around. As you said, he can't. He everyone knew him, and even outside of cricket, like they knew who he was in the yeah. states, which is pretty impressive for, like a non-American a non, sport. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he was, he just. I think it was his personality. It was just larger than life, and he could give everyone a bit of stick, and he could have just a... Just likeability, a likeable yeah. rogue. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Definitely a rogue, but a, de- a likeable rogue. And um, have you, are you got any photos with any of these people? or like, like um, I'm thinking Tiger Woods and Shane Warne. Uh, there there, must, got, be, there must be videos plenty, I've of got, you. I've got plenty with Warney. Right. Um, you know, well, I've got a photo last year at Donald Links when we played together, and it's... Uh, me and my wife, our little one who was oh, that's eight cool. months old at the time with, with um, 
Ian Botham and and Shane Warne. You know, that's, yeah, she's going to have no idea who either of them are growing up, probably. But uh, she'll learn. Well, she, she'll learn. Yeah. But yeah, it's you know kind of cool. And I've been lucky in golf in that respect to be able to play with so many, you know, so many sports stars that I've you know grew up <laughs> idolizing. You know, Stephen Fleming, Brendan McCullum. Um, you know, I had, you know, where, where Eric got in contact, you know, Eric, obviously. Um, but, you know, we had this little charity day in Auckland last week, Chasing the Fox. And, you know, we had a bunch of All Blacks, a bunch of cricketers, some Warriors guys, you know, John John Key. Yeah, got you know, a hole in one. Got a hole in one. And you, you go through all of that. And, you know, I'm kind of, I'm the, the host of that event. You kind of look at it and go, how, how am I... How have these guys come out to support me? That doesn't make any sense. That's like, so I'm, fucking I'm, cool. I'm, so I'm, you're, you're fangilling over them, but they're fangilling over you as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and think that's the cool thing with golf. That it's one of those sports that everyone can play, and it seems to be a pretty popular sport as a downtime for other sports people. I think because it's you know you can play it in a golf cart. You can it, it, you know, if you're a rugby player, you can just. There's no stress on your body, mm. and it's a bit of it's just a bit of fun, and it's nice downtime. It's outdoors. It's better than sitting in a hotel room watching TV or whatever. So, I think it just seems to be one of those sports that resonates with other sports people. And you know, you you play some of those pro am tournaments, and you can be sitting down with billionaires and you know movie stars and sports people and stuff like that, and they look at you for a little while. Like, I just wish I could do that like you do, and mm. you're like, well, I wish I could do a fair bit of stuff like you <laughs> yeah, do yeah, too yeah. yeah the feeling's mutual I think that's that's the funny thing about golf like um, to watch it on TV if you've never played golf yourself to watch it on TV it's the most boring fucking thing ever once you've gone out there and had a go yourself and you realise just how phenomenal it is what you guys at the top level do you have like a new appreciation for it yeah it's incredible yeah I mean it's definitely not it's like test cricket to an extent if you don't really un- understand what's going on it's kind of hard to get the drama of it yeah but if you understand and again that comes from playing golf that understand how hard some of the shots can be what it's like doing stuff under pressure i mean anyone that's played golf that's had a five foot putt to beat their mate for 10 bucks <laughs> on a on a sunday morning has felt a little bit of pressure right of and course. all of a sudden you, you know you've got that to win a tournament or win a major or you know to beat you know someone good or whatever that's that's multiplied by a hundred at the at the highest level. So everyone's kind of got appreciation for it. And it's kind of, I think, at, at once you get that, it's it's quite a, it's quite a good sport to watch. And you can get, especially with the coverage going forward, you're going to get a lot more golf to watch. I think then you know they're mm. pushing for, you know, literally you can follow your favorite player. I think that's what it's going to get to at some point where you can go. Well, there's oh, there's a, a camera like it, just on you for yeah, the entire. Yeah, so you yeah, can go. I yeah. want to watch. Tiger, or I want to watch Rory, or when someone wants to watch me for some reason, that they, you could watch every shot that everyone, yeah, anyone yeah. hits for the tournament, and it's gonna, at some stage, it's gonna go, go that way, which is quite cool. Wow, also quite alarming as well. Are you a nose picker? Are you? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes do you like put the golf tee in your ear because it feels nice? Yeah, I mean, think yeah, you have to stop that. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, you just kind of, yeah, it's like, oh, well, whatever. Yeah, if I get yeah. caught doing something like that, it's not the worst thing in the yeah, world. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay, so let's talk about like the week of a tournament. Um, like, like what, what does that look like? So it goes over four days. So like, usually a Thursday, it's, Friday, it's, it's, Saturday, it's, Sunday. A, it's basically a week when you go okay. through the whole thing. So, it's, so you're arriving as... But who does all your planning? Like, do, do you, are you planning? Management yeah. and my wife does a fair bit and I do a little bit, so it's kind of... Right. So you're all planned out. up for, for the 2023 calendar No, no, year? I'm... I've, I'm only got the first four weeks out of the way, right? So it's kind of just an ongoing process because okay. it, it's quite the schedule's quite flexible in that sense. Like, you know, you you might go, oh, well, this is what I plan to play in, but when it actually gets down to, oh, actually, I'm going to play this one instead of this one, and kind of thing. So yeah, you don't want to you don't want get it too far ahead of you. Yeah. So okay, so you arrive at a at a city on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday. It, it depends a little bit. Um, Travel day is normally a Monday. If it's a golf course I've played before and let's say it's in Europe and we're based in London most of the time, I might travel on a Tuesday morning. Um, and then it's probably play nine holes on a Tuesday, do some work with my coach, um, you know, do do some practice as well. Uh, pro-ams on a Wednesday. So, you know, playing with the with the sponsors of the tournament or whatever. Right. You know, there's probably 50 guys that play the pro-am on a, on a, um, on a Wednesday. And then 
you start on Thursday. Is, it, is that, by the way, is, it, is that a pain in the ass, or is it just a necessary? No, it's 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 normally pretty good. Like I yeah. I enjoy talking, as okay. you can probably tell. Yeah. Now, um, so you know, playing a, a lot of guys who are introverted would find that and it can be re- it can be really yeah. hard, and especially you know you get to play some in different countries where while it's great, you might have a whole group. I've played a couple in China where you get someone that doesn't you know, a whole group that doesn't speak a word of English so you're just like okay I'm just going to play my ball and talk to my caddy and that's it and yeah, that's all, yeah. all part of it and you get to meet some great people doing it as well so it's yeah you get the you get both sides of the coin yeah. in that respect but yeah I don't mind it I do know there's some guys that do do struggle with it and then obviously you, you start up on a Thursday Thursday Friday cut Friday night play Saturday, Sunday, and then either disappear Sunday night or, or Monday. Mm. And it kind of depends on if there's a tournament the next week or you're going back home or whatever. Yeah, and then like, so what, what about the evenings during a tournament? Like, do you do you meet up with your caddy after the round for a debrief or anything? Or it must be fucking lonely. You go out for dinner with your caddy or you just um, eat in your room? What do you do? Not – I go out to dinner with the caddy occasionally, um, but it's kind of – it's a hard one. I almost spend more time with my caddy than I do my wife during the year. <laughs> so if you start throwing dinners on top of it, like it's it's a, it's a stressful yeah. environment in that res- respect. So I think if you start doing the off-the-golf course stuff, it kind of bleeds in both ways. Like if you... If oh, it becomes having, a less professional relationship yeah, and or, harder or, to... Yeah, and it, it also becomes... He might do something that pisses you off off the golf course that you take on on the golf course and right. vice versa. So yeah. I'm really good friends with my caddy and I'll hang out with him, but we also try to, you know, during the week, we spend enough time together as it is on the golf course, on the practice range. I don't need to have dinner mm. with them too, but like I'll have generally mates that I'll have dinner with during the week um, and try to do a few of those and you might get one where you've got a really early start so you'll just sit, you know, watch TV in the room and have room service and go to bed early. It's... I travel with my family most of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, they probably did from July last year or this year till till I got home. They probably did seventy five percent of my tournaments. So it's quite cool. It's also quite tough with a toddler. Yeah. So your daughter, daughter turns two later this week. Yeah. On on Sunday. Yeah. Later this week. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, that would be yeah that would be hard because you just want to sleep and. You know, you got to keep, you got to focus, but it must also be nice in other ways to have them around because otherwise yeah. you'd be lonely and it's, bored. It's, yeah, it's it's definitely lonely by yourself, um, but it's an, it's kind of a nice distraction. Is probably the wrong word, but it it, it, it kind of is. It is yeah, the right yeah. word as well. Like it's gotcha. when I get back to the golf course or from the golf course, it's a it's a really good switch off. Right, I can go, I can hang out with my daughter, and you know, we can go for a swim or just go out to dinner and. I can leave golf at the golf course. Like when you're by yourself, sometimes you get in I your mean, own head. You know, everyone, everyone brings their work home with them. If you mm. do that too much, it gets pretty frustrating. And especially at the high level of sport, you know, if if you're having a bad run and you keep bringing it home, there's just no escape from it. So yeah. to have to have them travel, you know, and have some normality there is great. I mean, I will say it is nice every now and again having a hotel room by yourself where you can just go. <laughs> okay, I'm just. I take my Xbox every now and again. Play, oh, play. You're a gamer. Sh- well, golf. Not re- no. I don't play golf. <laughs> no, I just play the long. I play you know the long single player games. But it's just the. It's a nice escape again. For it's a way to go. Well, I can do that. Like if, especially if you got jet lag, I can do. If I watch TV on an iPad or whatever, I'm just in ten minutes. Whereas yeah. I can kind of keep myself awake with that if I need to to for a couple of hours. And it's again something I can do that I don't really think about anything else, and that's as bad as that sounds. Where lots lots of people use golf as an escape from everyday yeah, life. Yeah, that's true. I've got to find other ways to do it. When I'm yeah. back home, it's fishing. When it's overseas, it's you know having the family around the easy, the normal way. But if I don't have them, it's yeah, you know, get the Xbox out and go kill something on <laughs> on Xbox for a while. How how did you and your wife meet? Um. We actually met at a sports psychology class at university. Oh, shit. What's her name? An- Anika. 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 Yeah. So right. she, we, it was at a mutual friend of mine's birthday party, 21st birthday party, and um, one of her friends had brought my wife along, and um, then we found out we're in the same, we're in the same class at uni. I hadn't been. She'd never seen you. I, yeah. Well, she hadn't. She hadn't. She, <laughs> no she one had seen you. She hadn't seen me because yeah, no one had seen me. I hadn't been there. And then this friend that had brought her along had done the class the semester before us, 
So she kind of she basically set us up. She said, "Okay, well, I've got my notes from the previous semester. Do you guys want to use them?" I'm like, "Shit, yes, I haven't been to class yet." <laughs> and Annika's like, "Oh yeah, okay." And then so we met up for coffee, so I could basically steal some university notes off her, and it happened from there. Amazing, amazing. So you that was when you were you were just sort of getting into your golf. Yes, yeah, so you were golf, quite golf, deep into golf your golf. Was still, I think I was playing for New Zealand at the time. So, I mean, my mom. My wife hasn't known. We've been together for almost 15 years now. Yeah. So she hasn't known anything different. Like, in terms of amateur and professional golf, I used to go away a shitload. I'll be away most weekends. I'd go, I, I did a couple of long trips to the States for like three months. So it was normal for us to be apart right from the outset. So it's quite good in that regard. She kind of understands the... The life of it. The life of it. Yeah. Right, you know, it, and she's been really good and really supportive and has enjoyed the travel as well. It's... Yeah, it's been, it's a weird lifestyle mm. in that sense, but it's it's kind of been normal from yeah. us from the start. So it's a little bit, a little bit easier. I think it would have been harder, you know, if you're high school sweethearts or something and together, and then all of a sudden I'm you're away going from, away. I yeah. think that would be a hard dynamic to deal with. But once you kind of, if you start that way, it kind of doesn't really. Yeah, it just it evolves makes it, that way. Yeah, it makes it easier. So she's a psychologist. Uh no, she did. Oh. Um, she ended up doing a finance degree. Right. So she was a banker for a, a while. Right. And um, in 2015, I started playing in Europe. Um, and I did most of that travel just from here. And then was like, it's just too brutal. Um, so I wanted to get a base in London the next year. She was pretty keen to come up anyway. My sister lived in London. We had a lot of friends up in London. So she's like, oh, you know, I'll get a job up in London and in the bank somewhere. And we arrived six weeks before the Brexit vote. And told she tried to get a job. Got told, look, we're not hiring. Just wait till the Brexit vote goes away, because no one in London thought that Brexit would actually happen. Yeah, yeah. And then Brexit happened, and all of the contracting jobs that was her kind of specialty in London disappeared. So she actually ended up travelling with me for for that year. She caddied for me in a few events, and she travelled. She's pretty much travelled around ever since. And um, you know, been lucky enough. I've done a ride out of it that yeah, we kind of yeah. haven't needed two salaries or anything like that. And there's been a couple of dicey periods where it was, you know, my golf was a bit, bit average and we're burning some money, but thankfully it had a couple of good years previous, so it kind of, it evens itself out in the end. God, it's a stressful existence, isn't it? Yep, yep, it, it really is. is. Yeah, you I'm, must be. Yeah, you, you must feel super. You, you seem super relaxed at the moment, and uh, you know that must be a good place to be in for I'm, a golfer. I'm, get, I'm getting there. It takes me a good like week to ten days after the end of a season to kind of get down I've probably got two two weeks of being down and then I've got to try to get up again to yeah. to start the season off but yeah it's I think in, in general I mean in all walks of life there's you know if you're at the top level it's pretty stressful whether mm. it's in business or sport or, or media or whatever you know you've got there might be slightly different stresses but they still do the same yeah. still have the same effect so you get used to it and I'm certainly not complaining I love it but yeah, you you do enjoy the downtime. Yeah, I, I mean, after a good good year like twenty twenty two has been for you, it must be nice. It's like, thank fuck, I've got a bit of a buffer here. Um, I can just spend the next wee while concentrating on the golf, not worrying about the shit that's going on in the background. Yeah, I've I have noticed that. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here with you right now. Like, there's, I think, as you do better, there's a lot more stress on your time. So it's you've got to be a bit better at time management and. Um, I'm still kind of learning that to an extent. Like, say, last year I came home after an okay year and did a couple of little radio interviews and I could sit on my ass for for, th- for two months <laughs> kind of thing, and that's certainly not happened this year. But it's it's also good. It's a part, you know... Yeah, you know a victim of your own success yeah, yeah. in a way. And, the, and, you know, it's just... I've just got to... i got to know that I've got to, you know, still get time with the family. I still want to go out fishing when I'm allowed to. Um, <laughs> and so you know just kind of schedule those in and that's a bit more weather dependent than anything else yeah. you know catch up with mates I love getting on the barbecue so I do a fair bit of that so you know it's just I don't think I quite get to switch off as much as I used to but it's still nice to be home and yeah absolutely and, and you know the Kiwi lifestyle is a little bit less stressful than, yeah. than some of the other places around the world yeah absolutely now um, one, one thing that's a, a reasonably big focus on this podcast that I like to bring up with all the guests is, um, is their, their mental health how's, how's yours been for the most part over the years um, for the most part pretty good I mean I, I, yeah, I, have, I think it's, it's, it's especially important with you because it's such a mental fucking game yeah I mean I've had I've gone through bad runs and you know you've 
pointed out, you know, I've had chats to Steve Hansen. I've had a couple of chats to John Kerwin about it when I was mm. really down in the dumps. And um, so your your low points or your rock bottom, it's been sort of golf related. It's all golf related. Really? To be fair. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I talked about taking taking it home. I think I got to a point you know, a couple of times where I was once early on in my career, second year out, where I really I didn't have any fun in what was going on. I I kind of hated the game. And I was ready to give it up, and Dad caddied for me for a week and tried to just make it fun again. I had a good result, kept my kept my card for the following year, and then had sort of a six or eight week break and kind of reassessed things. I thought, well, I actually still want to keep doing this. I don't really want to get a normal job. And thankfully, you know, I got I got through that period and, and had a another period in twenty nineteen, um, which was it was when you when I think look back on it, it was kind of weird. I, I came off. Um, I'd won early in 2019, then we got married about a month after that, went on a great honeymoon in South Africa and then came back and I missed seven cuts in a row. And there was a lot of... You must some, start to see your self-doubt must creep yeah, in, in a that, big way at that, that point. that got me. I was really, really hating life at that point, which you know, at that point I shouldn't be. But mm. I just, I couldn't get out. I was playing bad. And there was a little other, there was other stuff that was causing it. To be fair, it wasn't. It, I'd changed orthotics, and the orthotics had upset my balance, and that was having a massive effect. Well, orthotics has like little pads in yeah, your shoes. Yeah, because I've got really flat feet that you can't see on here, but they're not real. Uh, they're, they're not. They're not. Uh, <laughs> hold it, hold, flick your flick your slides off and hold them up, Dougie. Can you get a close up on um... the the left one? The left one's shot, so it's pretty bad. Right. I don't. I literally don't have an arch on my left foot. That's kind of weird, but right, that is. Um, we, we tend to film a lot of feet on this. Podcast. Yeah, okay. We're gonna put that on OnlyFans. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I like I when and then you know in hindsight that was the thing that had affected my golf game. It you know balance is pretty important. I think in all sport, but golf it's really important. And you know I'd done I'd had the same set of orthotics for like ten years previous, and I changed them, and all of a sudden that upset everything, and my golf swing went south, and then then that affected how I played. But then that sort of went into the mental state, and that was a nice little downward spiral that I was, mm. you know, after all this good Fuck, stuff that had yeah. happened, I was, you know, through the middle of 2019, I was hating what I was doing and ready to give it up. And so did it sort of seep into other areas of your life as well? Yeah, just, I was just were... a grumpy fucker, basically. Yeah. And wh- which, you know, I, I, I've been lucky. I haven't had any you know, depression in that sense. Yes. But yeah. it's, you know, when that gets... I mean, I, I start having studied psychology. You know, the the signs for depression and the signs for, you know, grief. You know, say a family member dying are, are very, very similar. And yeah, they? you know, it's pretty. Yeah. You know, it's probably changed since I was at university. But it's like, you know, where there used to be some textbook that used to give all the stuff for depression, and then there was all these exemptions if you'd had a family member die and this and that and that, and I was probably in that, that I probably had some of the symptoms of it, but it was more work-related than, you know, straight depression mm. in that sense. So it was, yeah, it was it was tough, but it was, you know, I kind of figured out a few things later in the year, started playing a bit better golf and got a bit better at compartmentalising it. You know, I had a few chats to JK at that time, and, you know, he, he said something, I mean, he said it, in the media as well, that he always used to equate how he was as a rugby player as how he was as a person, and mm. that's kind of not the case. And I probably did that, and probably still do it to an extent with golf. But it's hard, yeah, it's hard to avoid though, isn't it? When well, you're when you're that that good at what you do. Well, uh, and I think you know if if you look at you know how you know out my family lives, everything is revolved around my golf. In that sense, mm. like you know, we travel because of my golf. We do this. I do everything around golf, so it's it's kind of hard, regardless to to separate away from that. So I and especially when you're playing bad, it's even it's even harder to do that. And I I really struggled with it at that point, and definitely had some some tough times during COVID as well. Um, you know, all the travel restrictions coming out of here in 2021, we, oh, yeah. we were normal on tour. Um, you know, whereas you know, we were still not letting anyone in, and I think I was pretty vocal in the media a couple of times. You were. About I remember that. you had a spray about that, an uncharacteristic spray. Yeah, I just, I just lost the plot. To yeah. be honest, I got to a point. Is that your 
end of your tether. Yeah, where it was just I'm, you know, I'd seen what it was like overseas, and I think a lot more Kiwis have seen that this year, and that you know the middle of last year, COVID really wasn't a thing anywhere in the world, mm. bar New Zealand and Australia and China, kind of thing, and we're still doing quarantine and we've still got that stupid lottery system, which. I don't think anyone. That was unfair. Oh, it was I, cruel. I, I don't think anyone thought that was a good idea, to be honest. Absolutely not. And I, I, I ended up being a benefactor of it. I ended up getting a spot and going overseas. And uh, I, I, I know that's it. That's. I mean, you don't hate the player. Oh, hate the game. Yeah. Um, but it's un, it's unfair that I was um, fighting for spots the same as people that were, you know, hoping to see family members that were dying. You know, we, you know, there was people in way worse positions than what I was. But I'm so I, I sort of looked at it in the fact that you know my job was completely normal i had to keep a job it's not like i could say hey look i'm a bit stuffed here you know can you i I can't make it overseas you know can we Mm. just keep going next year that's not how it works on tour so i had to i had to keep a job last year and i'm going well i don't know if i leave the country if i can get back in i've got a one-year-old you know i don't know if i can get to start with, they couldn't come to tournaments, so they weren't going to come to the states and mm. then uh, come to the UK. Sorry, and then when they could come to tournaments, they all came over, and then we go. Well, how do we get back home? And I'm still trying to fight for my job at that point to make sure I had a job for this year. Yeah. And all of that just kind of got to. I, I wouldn't never got to the point of what I was probably in not 2019, but I was really struggling with that whole concept, and I think that's why I probably lashed out at. Uh, anyway, it was and, frustration. And it, it was. Yeah. And, you know, there was, as I said, there was lots of people worse off than me, but I kind of felt like at that point I had a little bit of a platform to say something. And, you know, that regardless of wh- whether people agree with me or not, you know, everyone's got an opinion. And yeah. that was my opinion on it, that we, you know, after seeing the rest of the world, that, you know, shutting shutting everyone out in New Zealand and not having other options like home isolation or something like that was... Was yeah, was yeah, pretty yeah. frustrating, and, and you know when you see, I was at the Olympics last year and saw, you know there was plenty of other New Zealand athletes who couldn't go to World Champs because they couldn't get quarantine spots and stuff like that. And I, you know, I'd been one of the people that had just gone and gone overseas and just gone. Well, I'll try my I'm, luck. I'm gonna I'm gonna try my luck. Yeah. And you know, I was like you, maybe not quite this. I I got a spot eventually. I mean, I think I'd at one stage I'd been in every single lottery they'd been in and not been below 20,000 mm. places or something like that. And we eventually got a spot um, in late October last year, and that was purely because we were quite flexible at yeah. that point. We're like, if we get, if we can get in the room... We'll take get, whatever we'll date. Take whatever yeah, we can, sure. even if it's tomorrow, I'll go, kind of thing. And that's pretty much what it what it boiled down to. Mm. So, yeah, the last couple of years in that respect were, were, were challenging, challenging, but yeah. I, I think it was easier to to deal with that because it was factors outside of my control. Yeah. You know, and that's probably why it was also so frustrating because it was factors outside of my control. Mm. And then, you know, that's probably made what's happened this year even a bit sweeter in that regard to yeah. deal with that, all the crap that's gone down. And then, you know, Nick this year, you know, to sort of ride the wave the other way and, and have a great year on, you know, and, and all of those other stresses go away has been quite nice. Yeah, so you should just focus on the, the the task in hand. What's your um? What's your inner voice and inner critic? You like for the most part. You mentioned before when you have a bad shot, you can be hard on yourself. But for the most part, Ryan Fox is he pretty? Are you quite um, nice to yourself, or are you quite tough on yourself? I would say I'm generally quite nice to myself, apart from golf, <laughs> which I, I think as I, long as you can do, do that and compartmentalize it, I guess. Yeah, like I'm. I'd say I'm generally quite optimistic and quite positive about things, but. Yeah, if I had a bad shot in golf, I'll know about it. But yeah. as long as then, as we talked about before, you can get to the get to the move up and go to the ball for your next shot and put it behind. Yeah, you, and and it's not, a line it's not necessarily. It's not. It's like I don't take it too hard in that respect. Like I can, it's in perspective. It's you know, hit a bad shot, get angry, forget about it, mm. and you know, sort of don't let it get to me anymore. But it, I just can't help it. I mean, I, I, as I said, I think everyone playing golf, no matter yeah. how calm you are, everyone playing golf has lost the plot of themselves. And I think the the better you are at it, it just gets to you more and more. The yeah. longer you do it, it gets to you more and more kind of thing. Yeah, because there's, there's a guy I remember like growing up when uh, that I used to watch on TV. Um, oh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact story, but Ian Baker Finch, no, I know the, the, the Australian guy. Yep. So one of the best in the world, right? Yep. 
And then um, and then he just he he woke up one day and couldn't play anymore. Yep, just and that's tournament golf. So right. I, I know. Um, is, that, is that pretty much the story? Like, um, yeah, I, I, and I think I read much. about him in one of his last games. He shot something like close to a hundred, which is, is uh, if it, probably what I'd shoot on a very good day. And then he went to the locker room and cried, and that was the last time he played. Yeah, so he can play socially now. I know. Right. I know Ian well enough. So what was his what was his world ranking? Like he. Was, I, I mean, he won he won the British Open at St Andrews in nineteen ninety one. Okay. So he was good. And then, like, and then when did he? A couple so, of years later. Uh, yeah. So he went back. No, he, he didn't win the British Open. Sorry, he won the British Open. I don't. I don't know where it was. And he went back the following. He might have won in ninety, and w- went back the following year in ninety one at St Andrews and hit it out of bounds off the first tee, which is one of the kind of the. It's known as the widest hole in golf. Like no one can do that. And he did it. And that's oh, I can't, was I could do it. The, yeah. And but that's kind of the down. Like yeah. you can do it. But it's sort of it's sort of one of those things that, as, that a, level, a, it's as a pro, it's kind yeah. of unheard of, and that was kind of the start of his downfall. And I heard stories from from guys, you know, just before he gave the game up, that he would he'd play a practice round with them on a hard golf course, and you know they'd play for money, and he'd absolutely towel them up. You know, he'd he'd shoot sixty six like it was nothing, take their money, and turn up on a Thursday, and he just couldn't play tournament golf. He struggled, and that's... So it's all mental. It's all mental, and that's... There's lots of... I mean, the yips is a thing in golf, you know? Right, is been, that what it's called, the yips? Yeah, what and I don't know if he had the yips per se, but there's, you know, yeah. there's you know guys that get over and can't hit a putt. It's literally... It becomes physiological in the end. They get over a three-foot putt and go... And it's it's quick and jabby, and, you, you know, you kind of shudder when you look at it, and people have it chipping, people have it with driver. It's... It seems I don't know if it's as common in other sports. Yeah, I could imagine maybe. I could imagine you know something like big wave surfing or, mm. or, like, car racing where you've had a close call and all of a sudden you can't quite push yourself. Or yeah. well, maybe batting sim- in cricket if you yeah, get yeah, hit, or get hit, hit yeah. Hit like, in the head. So I, whereas, you know, when you think of golf, it's kind of nothing. Dangerous <laughs> per se, right? Like all yeah, of the, all, the, the all most of dangerous those, thing is getting hit with someone else's ball. Yeah, and and like when you think about it, it kind of doesn't make sense. But I think because golf is so mental, and I think it's one of those games that it's not reactionary. So you know, if I throw you a ball right now, you just catch it, right? That's what happens. You don't think about where you have to put your hands or what you do. You mm. just catch it. In golf, because that ball doesn't move, you've got to you've got time to think about what you actually do. And I think that's why you it's more prone to stuff like that, that, you know, you've got all those thoughts have a chance to get in you. And in, you know, in sport, anything that you do that's conscious is harder to do. You know, yeah. you, you want everything to be almost unconscious, right? Like just a pure reaction to whatever's in front of you. And when you, you know, you talk about people that, have done exceptional things in sports all about being calm and being in the moment and stuff like that and you try to get in that pl- in that place in golf but it's also prone to the other way because you've got so much time to think about what's going on mm. it's and i think that's where it comes from like yeah is, is that do you think in hindsight that's what happened to you when you had that run of missing seven cuts in a row not necessarily no? um i was just oh, like there was definitely some of it like you put more external pressure on yourself and you're like, well, this, you know, this is to make a cut. I missed a bunch of cuts by one, you know, bogey the last hole, missed a cut by one kind of shit. And yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, that's mental. I I didn't get to a point where I couldn't find the golf course or couldn't hit it on the golf course. So it wasn't, you were there or thereabouts. I I could, I could still hit it, but it just, that all that little stuff was just, there's just too much noise, Mm. right? When you play your best, there's no, there's no noise. It's all very quiet and all very kind of easy. And you know, even when you're under pressure, you can kind of trick yourself to not worry about it too much. But when, you know, if you're in a bad state mentally, then all that little stuff builds up and it just becomes a bit too hard. And obviously, you know, there's been instances, you know, Ian Baker Finch is one, there's been plenty of other guys in the same boat as him that, you know, literally got to a point where they they couldn't cope with the pressure of playing tournament golf yeah so so are you sort of i don't want to put words in your mouth but are you sort of saying like when you had that bad run um maybe you, you know you'd go up to the ball and you're thinking about a lot of different things but when you're in that flow state like you have been for the past year um you just go up to the ball and it's just instinct yeah and that's what you're trying like it's i think it's hard to be instinct 
fully instinctual anyway because yeah. – you know, you've just got so much time. I mean, you've played golf. It's you stand there and you go, "I don't want to hit it here," and I don't want to hit it here. So it's quite it's quite hard to get to that point. But that's what you kind of aim for, and you just get the better you are at it, the better you get at tricking yourself to be in that yeah. mindset or, or to find a way to to not think about the bad stuff. You mm. know, for me this year, it was pretty much go out and try to beat the golf course. Don't think about yeah. anything else. And it's inherently simple, but it's inherently complex as well. When you, if you break it down, you know you, you're getting rid of all that noise. You, you just trying to be comfortable, and it, you know it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be. You just have to get it done, kind of thing. And it's that's the idea of you know getting rid of the noise. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Shit, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's a, uh, yeah. I mean, my, the the top level There's of no sport like it. Wow. Well, there's probably a few, but I th- I think yeah, just the difference is that with the ball not moving really. Mm. It's 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 m- probably a bit more mental than a lot of mm. other sports in that regard. And Absolutely. I think we've also got you know a lot of different skills to master. You know, putting is so different than chipping. That's so different than bunkers. That's so different with driver. You know, there's there's a lot of different little aspects to it, and that's I think that it's a game you never conquer. I think that's what. <laughs> I, I, yeah. what, what you hate and what you love about the game in the same in the same yep. instance, right? Like you can hit a perfect golf shot, right? I can go, I want to hit this and literally pull it off perfectly, but you can't you can't ever be perfect. You know, we talk about Eric, right? Eric and Hamish Bond were perfect, right? Not what was it? Oh, never. Yeah, 60, was it 60, 67 from sixty-seven or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, over many years. Yeah. You know, you can't do that. Golf's just not that. Yeah. You know, you can't. You, you know, a golfer lives for a perfect shot, and we, you know, we still don't hit perfect shots all the time. Mm. We might hit a few more than most average amateurs, but our bad's just not as bad. But we still live for that one that you're like, oh, why can't I do that every time? Yeah, well, mate, yeah, as someone that's played a lot of golf in their twenties, usually shooting between like a hundred and a hundred and ten, I found it the most frustrating thing in the world. And there, there'd, there'd be holes where I shoot like eight, nine, ten, but then you have one shot yeah. where it feels like you're hitting it like Ernie Els, and it just flies off the club and it goes where it's supposed to, and that was all it took to keep me coming back yep, the next that time. Is, that is, that's the golf bug, right there. You know, it's. But you have you have at least one of those shots every hole. No, not necessarily every hole. You just get. <laughs> You, the parameters of it get a bit different, right? Mm. Like, you know, you. I hit a lot of good shots when I play. A lot. But I don't hit a lot of. I mean, it, it, the, my definition of perfect is probably slightly different than what your average golfer's definition of perfect yeah, is. A green so and I, regulation is perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, so, like. In a sense, I probably only hit the same amount of perfect shots in that sense for what I see in my head. But obviously I hit a lot of shots that I'm not disappointed with mm. in that sense as well. So it's yeah, it's just, I mean, there's lots of quotes about golf's not about you know how good your good shots are, it's how good your bad shots are. And that's kind of what, what we do well as professionals. Yeah. You just hit a lot. You still have bad shots, but your bad shots just aren't anywhere near as bad as what they are otherwise. Yeah. Okay. So twenty twenty three. Obviously, you want to. The, the the I suppose the goal or the dream or the the hope or the wish, whatever you want to call it, is to build on what you've done in twenty twenty two. So if, at the end of twenty twenty three. If everything goes to plan, what would have happened? Um. Probably have a PJ Tour card for next year. Right. So, um, I'll so get that ch- means you plan the the states. Yeah. So I'll get a chance to play a bunch of the bigger events in the states with being in the top fifteen in the world rankings, and basically that's the you know the goal next year. I th- it's going to be tough. It'll be like playing a major championship every week. You know they'll be on the best golf courses there on the strongest fields, and everything's new as well, right? You know I had this. I'll be playing a lot of events I've never played, a lot of golf courses I've never played before. So what, 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 do, you, what do you mean exactly? Is it, can you give it like a simple answer to that? Because most people listening to this will be like, man, a golf. You know, there's there's well, the flag, there's the green, there's the the bunker. It's is, it's is kind it, of like it's it's uh, it's kind of like going to a new house, right? You know, if you. You said you moved in here not long ago, yeah. right? You put stuff in a drawer when you when you're setting it up, and then it takes you a few weeks to kind of remember where everything is, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and 
then you've been in, you know, you do it enough times, you could do it drunk in the and dark. Blind, you can do it drunk and blindfolded. Mm. It's it's easy, right? It's kind of the same on a golf course. You know, I could play my home course in my head right now, I'll tell you what everything does, and I don't even have to look at it. I know where mm. everything is. I don't have to. But you know, we've got to go to a golf course, arrive on a Monday, play it Tuesday or Wednesday, or both, and then tee it up and play it in competition on a Thursday. You still fiddling around with those drawers trying to figure out where everything is right okay. you know you we, again you you you're good at it like it's our job we're supposed to be good at it but you know you're playing against guys still an unfamiliar environment yeah yeah so you know say go to go to the masters next year right it'll be my first time there the tigers played what 20 of them mm. won it however many times he's probably played more than 20 to be honest he's probably played 30 close to 30 of them now you know, he's obviously going to have a much better knowledge of that golf course over the years than what I do. Yeah. So it's it's not that it's not a f- fair playing field. It's just you know experience matters. It's you know it's the same for a rugby player. You know, in your first test, you know, or your first season playing test test rugby, everything's going to be new. All the grounds are going to be new. They've all got little intricacies and. You know, de- you, you're still trying to figure out ways to deal with the atmosphere and whatever, and then you know you go ten years down the line, and you've just got all your processes down packed how you yeah. deal with it, and you know it's not ne- you may not necessarily be a better player or whatever, but you you can get yourself to the same point a lot easier than what you used to be able to. You know, you can get this, that same level. It's kind of it's the same for us for golf. You know, I can go play a bunch of events in Europe that I've played five, six, seven times, I've got a really good memory for golf courses and, you know, it just makes the practice and everything a lot easier knowing the golf course. So, you know, next year is going to be a bit more challenging in that regard where, you know, especially for the first half of the year, all the golf courses I'm going to are, are going to be brand new and, you know, be trying to take a little bit to, to figure out how to play them. Fuck, how exciting though. And oh, can, yeah. can, can you win a major? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard, obviously, but, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Yeah, but I feel like I've felt for a while now, but especially after this year, that if I play my best golf, I can compete with anyone in the world. It's just, you know, in that situation, it's trying to not let the situation get the better of you, which is much easier said than done. Mm. Um, but, you know, just get out of your own way, get rid of all the noise and try to beat the golf course. And I, you know, hopefully can get myself in that position, you know, this year, next year, whenever it is, and you know, if you give yourself a chance, anything can happen. Oh man, how good, how good! I don't, don't know if this is something that um plays on 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 your mind at all, but uh, after growing up being Grant Fox's son, it must be nice that he's now your dad. I you still know, that guy over I, there, I, that's I still, Ryan I, Fox's dad. I still don't know about that. I mean, you know, we're a rugby mad country in that sense, but um. I mean, it's, I think it's pretty cool to say that I've got three generations of my family that's represented New Zealand in three different sports. I don't think there'd be too many other families worldwide that could say, could say that that you know, and the, and the yeah, same and, and the same yeah, sport yeah. potentially, but when you've got cricket, rugby, and golf, you know, they they don't get a whole lot different than the three of those. Mm. So it's you know that's that's pretty cool. So there'll be no pressure on my kids at all. <laughs> <laughs> you you you've got a daughter who uh, I mentioned before turns two in a couple of days. Are you planning to have more? What's yeah, we've, the... we've got another one on the way actually. Oh, so, congratulations! Yeah, so just make next year a bit more hectic. So I got one due in May. Oh, amazing! Have, do you know what the sex is yet? No, no, we're keeping that a surprise. So yeah, yeah that's gonna gonna be nice and busy. Um, so I don't know what next year looks like travel-wise for the family. Um, you know, one's hard enough. I can imagine travelling with two is going to be chaos. So we'll see where that goes. Well, you're going to need to start getting the hotels with the adjoining rooms. Oh, we already do that, to be <laughs> fair. There's nothing worse than putting a, putting a kid down to bed at 8 o'clock and sitting in a dark room. <laughs> Just watching Netflix on your phone. Yep, pretty much. All right. Hey, Ryan Fox, thank you so much for taking the time to come over today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been amazing. It's been great. Thanks, Dom. Oh, one final thing. Can you, um, would you better sign my balls? <laughs> I got two I just, I got two just for that reason. I like the fact that one's, a, one look, well, one's definitely been eaten by the dog. Yeah, one's a, one's a little bit rougher than the other. Oh, dear. Are you actually signing them? Yeah, I just wanted to say that line for a joke, but you've you've done I've this before. Done it. I have, yeah. They're not that hard to sign. 
And I haven't signed a top flight for a while. I haven't used one of those since I was about 10 years old. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> it was in the bottom of my golf bag. So that was, yeah, when you were 10, that was probably the last they, time they, I played yeah, golf. Yeah, they, the, they were the old, uh, we used to call them rocks. Right. Yeah, but they were great as a 10-year-old because you could. they didn't cost very much and you right. could find them anywhere. Maybe that was my issue. I had the wrong balls. Yeah. <laughs> they, do, they, do, they do make a difference. I'll tell you that. All right. Hey, you're an absolute legend, man. Um, 2022 has been a phenomenal year, and um, hopefully this is just the beginning of a, um, you know, a very big rise into reaching your peak. I hope so. I mean, we're lucky in golf that it's, you know, still got a career in your mid-30s, so hopefully it continues that way. Yeah, how good. All right. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Dom. Cheers.